Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to Legal English Masterclass with the London School of English. Today's live stream is designed for lawyers and law graduates around the world who want to excel in their legal career with better English communication skills. Uh, and um, uh, we have a little bit of a glitch over here uh, in terms of the audio, but uh, now everything should be fine. So just to continue, um, the, today's live stream is designed for lawyers and law graduates around the world who want to excel in their legal career with better English communication skills. And uh, those skills, as we know, are quickly becoming a key to success. On today's live stream, we're joined by one of our expert English trainers who has a professional background as a lawyer himself, Ziad al Ravi. Hi, Ziad. Hi there. Hi. Um, so Ziad has extensive experience in teaching legal English to our clients from around the world, from such countries as Italy, Brazil, UK, Spain, Switzerland, Japan, from, from different other countries, from, from the Middle East. Uh, and uh, we hope that this session will help you with practical advice on how to get your legal English to the next level and gain improve uh, confidence and insights into language learning strategies. Uh, we are also joined by Silvia Cupini from uh, our client services team. Um, hi, Silvia. Very hello. hello. You. And uh, so Silvia frequently works with clients who need professional uh, legal English training. So she's here to help you with any questions related to uh, our legal English courses. And uh, my name is Olga, and I'm part of the London School of English team. So. Uh, Today's session is meant to be very interactive. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the live stream. Uh, so the main part uh, of the live stream would be 30 minutes uh, or about around 30 minutes and then 10 to 15 uh, minutes for questions and answer session. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. And uh, if there are any questions left, uh, and we, for example, don't have time for them, for them. we will make sure to answer the, them in the comments below the video. But uh, you can also get in touch with us via email, uh, which we will show later on screen. So uh, now, uh, without any further ado, I'm extremely excited to introduce to you uh, two of my colleagues, Ziad uh, and Silvia. Now, Thank, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Olga. Yes, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ziad, uh, and uh, just uh, by, way, by way of background, so I'm from Kent, which is in the southeast of England. Uh, I studied business law at uh, Bournemouth University and then obtained my legal qualification as a solicitor uh, by studying the legal practice course at the University of Westminster and completing my training contract, which was for two years uh, at a mid-sized law firm in London. I then practiced law uh, in England and Wales for over 10 years uh, at various legal practices, uh, from large corporates to high street practitioners, mainly in civil law, with experience in residential and commercial property and civil litigation, so mainly uh, sort of court work. Uh, I've been teaching English uh, to uh, students from around the world for the past seven years, mainly in London, but I have talked uh, privately abroad as well. Uh, I'm a trainer at the London School of English, uh, teaching mainly English uh, for law and business, and that's me by way of introduction. Uh, and I know obviously Olga has kindly mentioned that Sylvia as well. So I'd just like to briefly say hello to Sylvia and maybe she'd like to just uh, mention a few words about her good self. Brilliant, thank you, thank you, Ziad. Yes, so I've been uh, working for the London School for at least for the last two years. Um, uh, I work in the sales team. So I'm the person who goes around the world promoting our courses. Um, I specialize in my favorite course is in fact the legal English and I do uh, travel and meet loads of um, um, lawyers all around the world in uh, big or smaller legal firms. Um, I do also have a training background so I've um, I taught English for 10 years and I decided to have a little break and then move to the sales department for the London School. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And I see that we've got uh, people from all over the world. We've got uh, Somalia, we've got Brazil, fantastic, Turkey, a bit more closer to home, Aberdeen in Scotland, fantastic. <laughs> great, 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 wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And I'm hoping to be able to provide you with some helpful and useful information and content that you can take away with you 
Hopefully, in some cases, you can implement it straight away. Uh, and in other cases, you can obviously work your way through it. So maybe just to start with a little bit, obviously, uh, you know, what, what is legal English? Uh, I mean, obviously, we know English as a general language, and we know that there are obviously people speak it all over the world. But when we talk about legal English, what, what do we actually mean by this? So effectively, I would say that it's language that's used by legal professionals during the course of their work. So some of the language, obviously, that we use as part of our day to day work, even within a legal practice, is very much general language, obviously used, for example, for greeting uh, or talking to colleagues, maybe about a particular case. But we maybe use very, very general language. Um, however, when we're talking, obviously, to a client uh, and maybe to people within the legal system, such as judges, uh, the language will be very different and it generally tends to be more formal both with clients and judges of course as lawyers you know get to know their clients uh, you know the need to be formal at least when speaking to them face to face or on the phone may be less however the writing element generally remains um, uh, remains formal with some email exceptions so when you're talking to a friend for example you might use language to make suggestions and recommendations. However, when talking to clients, your language is more specific and to the point. So for example, as a lawyer, one of your skills is to give a client legal advice. And so when talking or writing to a client, your language needs to be very clear, trying to avoid using legalese. And what do we mean by legalese? Well, this is the kind of language that you would expect maybe lawyers to speak to one another using, which the, the general lay person will not necessarily understand. Uh, for example, uh, a lawyer might say something like, Mr. Smith, I would advise you to commence legal proceedings against Mr. Jones for breach of contract. This would be a very obviously formal sentence you would probably expect uh, a lawyer to use. Um, whereas, for example, uh, a, a, you know, a general language expression or the same sentence might be something like, John, I think you should sue Mike as he broke the contract. So as you can see, there is more formality in the first sentence compared to the second sentence. Clearly, the level of spoken and written English needs to be very high as you're advising clients, communicating with third parties, such as judges in court and witnesses who may be supporting your client's case. So obviously, when we when you are, as you can see here, as you saw from those two sentence examples, when you are talking generally, obviously your language and the, the, the nature of the language that you use can be a little bit more relaxed. Whereas when obviously when you are advising a particular client or you're talking to a specific person within the legal profession, your language has to be a lot clearer. And therefore, it's very, very important that you obviously select the right words. Otherwise, there could be misinterpretation involved in that, which, of course, can lead to problems. Additionally, you need to have high levels in reading and listening. Regardless of the area of law, there are always law reports or laws that you need to be able to read and understand and, and then explain to a client or possibly another individual who is not a lawyer in a language they can understand. So. Obviously, not only do you have the challenge of the legal language itself, even in your own language. So, for example, if you know from whether it's in Brazil or Turkey or Somalia, you know, these countries, obviously, they have their own legal systems and their own specific language, specific legal language. So clearly, when you are trying to use this language, you need to obviously understand it yourself. But then the next challenge for you to then do is when you are trying to explain this particular area to a, a lay person, to your client, who is not necessarily that knowledgeable in that area, you need to try and use more simplified language. And obviously this is very challenging. So the ability to, to basically read sometimes complex legal language and then explain it in a way that can be more easily understood is the challenge, which of course many of us face uh, and hopefully many of us succeed in doing as well, of course, as we, as we develop our skills. Another important area, obviously, of being a, a communicator as well in, in the legal language are your listening skills. Um, to, to be able to know how to reply to a question or respond to a point being made either by a client or a judge. For example, when you meet a client for the first time, you need to be able to listen carefully to the information they are giving to you about their potential case and know when to interrupt to either make 
an important note about something or to ask them a question on something they have just said. Training your ear to listen out for the important facts and responding as necessary is another important skill. We'll talk a little bit more about the kind of materials that are available that you can use to obviously develop these skills a little bit later on down the line. Now, uh, as you know, depending of course on your, your level of, of experience uh, in the field of law, um, you may be aware that there are effectively two main legal systems. We have a codified legal system and an uncodified legal system. A codified legal system is one where there is a written code stating all the laws in the country, like, for example, in Italy or in France. Whereas an uncodified system would be one like we have here in the UK, you know, where we have common law, also known as case law, uh, where law develops in line with cases. Of course, as a result of this, this impacts on some of the legal vocabulary we use when talking about each system. Some of the vocabulary is the same uh, and has the same meaning. For example, we have this term force majeure, uh, which effectively would mean act of God. Uh, and I'm sure you probably many of you have heard this term force majeure, uh, you know, in, in your readings, uh, you know, in legal literature. Just out of interest, um, are there any words or expressions which are of uh, which, you, which you are aware of, which you use in your own language, which is the same word in English, but the meaning is different, just out of interest. Does anyone have any uh, any suggestion or anything they'd like to offer? I'll also give people some food for thought on that one. So the question again is, are there any words or expressions which you are aware of, which you use in your language, and it's the same word in English, but the meaning is different? An example uh, possibly we, we one could maybe think of is, uh, I think in Spanish there is a, a word uh, which is articulo, which is potentially a false friend because the way that it's used in, in the Spanish language is not so much used in the same way as we use it here in English, for example. Although we do have the word articles in English, so for example, articles of association when talking about company law matters, we generally refer to this particular word as a, a statute or an act. So these are the, you know, so this type of vocabulary can sometimes be a little bit confusing and may be a bit misleading when you're trying to sort of, you know, understand what are the correct words to use when you're trying to explain something. Ah, consideration. Okay, uh, Andrea, thank you. Consideration. So when you say consideration, what is your understanding of the word consideration in your own language? Because, uh, of course, it can mean something very, very different to the way that we use it in, in the English language. Just give uh, Andrea a moment. Consideration is compensation. Okay. But in Portuguese, it means something different. OK, right. So that's actually a really, really good uh, example. So consideration is actually uh, a word that we use here a, a lot when we talk about within a contract. So one of the elements of a contract is consideration. So, for example, um, I want to buy a house. So um, I put forward an offer. So, for example, Mr. Jones, I want to buy your house uh, for £100,000. So Mr. Jones is offering the house for sale and I'm offering them £100,000. So there is an offer and there is an acceptance, hopefully of that offer. And the consideration is the money basically. So it's, it's the interaction between the money and the house. This is the consideration involved. So that's a very, very good example of a word where that could easily lead to confusion. So just one or two tips, just in relation to the issue of vocabulary. I often sort of tell uh, and advise clients when, when trying to sort of remember words is don't try to use or try to learn too many words at once. It simply doesn't work. The best thing to do is to maybe take two or three words at any one time, try to master them. So for example, the word consideration, you might want to try to then try to understand it better when you're trying to use it in English to remember it's one of the elements of a contract, for example. Um, and then what you can then do is obviously once you have once you have mastered these words, you can then begin to use them with more confidence. Um, and I gave the I gave I, I give the example when when advising a client about a contract. You might say, um, for example, a sentence like, "You must uh, you must be careful not to break the terms of the contract." Instead of using the word "break," you can use the word "breach," as this is the more commonly used legal term. Of course, if you say the word "break," you'll still be understood, 
But if you want to sound more accurate when giving legal advice to a client, it's better to use the word breach. So that's one thing. And sort of a follow on really to that particular tip there. The second thing is when you are uh, trying to learn English legal vocabulary, because it's very, very specific vocabulary, it's actually easier to chunk the words together and to try to learn multiple words in, as part of one sentence, rather than trying to learn each word individually and separately. So I, I give an example here where I say, both parties must comply with the contract. So the sentence is, both parties must comply with the contract. So rather than learning the words comply with and contract separately, you can actually put them all together. And then of course, then you can try to apply it in real life situations, or of course, even in situations where you can, you can simulate uh, the, you know, as if you're carrying out uh, some legal advice to a client, you can practice doing this and using this type of language, which will be very, very helpful and useful. Um, and yeah, so just as a follow on from that particular point, just out of interest uh, of the people that are currently with us and those hopefully that are also joining us now, um, what legal system are you either trained in or maybe you are currently a student or you are in, in an internship and you are currently training at the moment. So what legal system are you trained in or training in just out of interest? Let's see if we've got uh, some jurisdictions which are maybe close to home or possibly far away. Uh, Clarissa here, sorry, you, uh, come, just coming back to one of your comments, you mentioned the word statute. So Clarissa, just out of interest, uh, the, the term statute, how, how, how is it used in, uh, in, your, in your neck of the woods, in your jurisdiction? Just give Clarissa a few moments maybe to think about that. And also some other things just out of interest, just to see, to gauge a bit more about the audience. Do you, do you practice civil or criminal law? I think a, a, lot, of, a lot of the time I find in my experience that a lot, a lot of the, uh, the clients that I deal with are predominantly uh, focused on civil law. And so they deal with things like company law, or employment law. Uh, very few people deal with criminal law, although of course it is a, an important area, at least to understand the very basics around, uh, around criminal law. Um, okay. Civil law, so, oh good, yep, so interestingly, uh, civil law seems to be uh, the case. Yes, Clarissa, you say uh, Brazilian, yeah, Brazilian, uh, so, 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 you use it. ah, I see, so the, the word statute, you use bylaws instead of statute, I understand, yes. Yeah, we, we do have the word bylaws here as well, of course, which we, 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 ha we do use, but we use that a lot less uh, in, in terms of the, the common terminology when we're talking about the, the laws of England and Wales, we generally refer to to statute or to, uh, as I say, to uh, to acts uh, within Parliament, for example. Um, and are there any are there any particular legal terms that you struggle with? So clearly, um, I, I've given some examples already, but uh, there are maybe some other terms that you yourselves find can be quite confusing. You've given a, a great example, for example, of the word uh, consideration. But are there any other legal terms that you yourself struggle with when you're trying to think of it in your own language and then put it into the English language. So it gives some people some time. Okay. Excellent, Andrea. Good to know. Yes. I hope, uh, hope you're finding your time in London good. <laughs> and also just generally something else to think about is what other areas of legal English do you struggle with as well? So again, feel free to put it into the, into the comment box as well. And we'll hopefully be able to maybe give you some, some hints and tips as to how to manage that. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll come back to that a little later on. So of course, when it comes to speaking, I, I find in my experience that speaking to clients is in English uh, is a big issue for many legal professionals, especially when you're trying to explain legal issues in your area of law compared to their own legal system. Uh, which may obviously be very different. So, for example, uh, if you're a property lawyer in your country and you try to explain your legal system to an English client who has some or maybe a lot of knowledge uh, about the legal system in England, clearly there are going to be differences in the processes of the way that you obviously have, you know, your property law in your country and the way 
that we practice uh, property law in, in the UK. But I have found, certainly again from experience, that there are possibilities where you can use similarities between the systems to try to explain things a little bit better to a client. Uh, if you are able to do that, then you can obviously make the conversation go a lot smoother and their understanding will be greater. So, of course, this is where vocabulary will come in, come in very useful, because if you can use terminology that they will understand within their own language and the meaning is almost the same as it is in your own language, that will help obviously allow the conversation and their understanding to go a little bit better. Um, and I know it may seem hard to begin with, but of course, uh, you know, anything worth learning takes time. So if you don't have the vocabulary or the knowledge, perhaps invest in an online course in that specific subject area. So if you're a property lawyer, for example, and you want to know about the basics of UK property law, uh, do a UK property law course. That would be one, one example. Uh, let me just see, sorry, Tanya here, please. Oh, it does it go to order to and politely introduce myself to the company for the first time. Oh, Tanya, it's a good question. I suppose it depends. So, so Tanya's question is, uh, you know, if I worked uh, for a, uh, as a, uh, so if I worked as a federal auditor, how do, how would I politely introduce myself to a company for the first time? Well, of course, if it's going to be uh, in, if you're talking, are you talking in written format or are you talking in uh, in spoken format? I mean, if it's spoken format, um, it would obviously depend on who you're introducing yourself. Uh, to uh, within the company, but you can say, you know, for example, uh, good afternoon. You know, my name is Tanya uh, Giestas, for example, excuse me, apologies if I haven't pronounced that correctly. Uh, and then of course you can explain maybe your position. And I am a, uh, a federal auditor with, for example, a certain institution. Uh, hope that sort of answered that question in terms of as if you were to say it uh, verbally, if you were to say it in spoken format, then uh, sorry, if you were to say it in a written format, then you could, for example, say, dear, um, if it's to an organization that you do not know, for example, you could start it as dear sirs. And if you do know the, the organization that you're writing to, then you can obviously then just simply address it to the particular individual. So dear Mr. or dear Miss or Mrs., depending of course on who that person is. And you would usually use their last name. So it would, for example, if it's uh, you know Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith, for example, you would simply use it in that way. Okay. Yes. Um, that was so that, that was my first big tip, tip just coming back to it if you can try to use um, you know your own system to try to explain so, so try to use some of the vocabulary within uh, the similarities between your system and the system of your client to try to obviously explain the process a little bit better that's one tip that does sometimes prove quite helpful um, if you work for example in an international law firm or you have colleagues in English speaking countries perhaps arrange a Skype call or a WhatsApp call with them and practice explaining your system to them and make sure you tell them in advance that you want them to give you, you know, to correct you or make notes and then give you feedback. Uh, this is a great way to build up your relationship with your colleagues and also build up your own confidence levels. You could also use the same person as an accountability person. And what do I mean by that? So someone who can encourage and push you uh, and help you to maintain what you have started. Many of us are very, you know, have very good intentions to do certain things, but we start it and we never finish it. However, if you have someone you need to report to, maybe every week or every month, for example, this puts pressure on you in a good way uh, to complete the tasks. It can also help you to identify where you are struggling. So, for example, you know, if it's for pronunciation, maybe there are certain words which are very important words that you need to be able to pronounce correctly, which you are struggling to, to obviously pronounce. And as a result of that, the person listening to you cannot quite understand you and it's making it difficult to understand what it is that you are trying to actually explain. So this is maybe one thing that you can you can pick up from that. Um, and once you've obviously then identified these issues, you can then form a plan on how to, you know, how to basically work through it so that you can get better at pronunciation, for example. OK, um, just touching on the issue of, of, of courses, of course, there are professional courses which focus on legal English like at the London School of English. Uh, and there are courses which uh, focus on the law itself specifically. So depending on your level of English, if you feel that you could do with a course on legal English, you could do that first. And if you feel you need more legal knowledge in a certain area, you should then be able to do a legal course where your level of understanding should be greater. So once you've done the legal English course, 
and you've got a better command of, the, for example, the vocabulary uh, and maybe some of the, the, the systems within, within that particular country, you can then maybe more, do a more in-depth course. So, for example, if you do employment law, you can do an employment law course, which specifically focuses on the areas of employment law within, within, within the UK, for example. OK, so that's just something else uh, to take into consideration. So earlier, uh, I talked about reading uh, being an important skill. Uh, one of the best ways to improve is to read legal publications. Uh, so just out of interest, do, do, do any of the people currently listening read any legal publications? Hi, Francesco. How are you? Hope you're keeping well. <laughs> Yes, so legal publications are very, very, um, I think, a, a great way to uh, improve your listening skills. Um, this is, I think, without doubt, one of the best ways that you can obviously develop your vocabulary. And also it begins to help you to understand how the sentences are structured as well when we're talking uh, you know, about legal matters in legal English. It's a great way to, to develop yourself. Now, I know obviously we're all very busy with our workload, uh, whether you are studying law at the moment or you have a job or maybe you're both studying and you're obviously working, which means your, your work is even, even greater. Uh, and therefore you feel that there is never enough time. But surely you can get some, you know, you can put some time aside for something that you need, even if it's 10 minutes a day. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot of time, but believe me, when you spend 10 minutes a day, that's about 70 minutes a week. So that, well, that, that's, of course, if you include weekends, which equals 3,640 minutes a year. That's just over 60 hours. That's a lot of reading time, 60 hours, even though it doesn't sound like a lot when you say 10 minutes a day. So maybe now you're thinking, OK, I can spend 10 minutes a day, but what do I read? Of course, there are plenty of legal publications which cover both general legal issues and also specific areas. With my clients, I always recommend the Law Society Gazette as a good starting point. As it reports on legal issues, both UK and abroad, and it also has some uh, articles on specific areas of law, like for example, property law, insolvency, uh, maybe for those obviously at an advanced level, they can read those more detailed articles. They tend to be a lot more, a lot more in depth, uh, you know, running onto several pages, even if you're reading it online. So that's definitely something that you can, you can start reading. Uh, the other uh, publications, I'm sorry, by the way, the Law Gazette is free. So it's a free publication which you can access uh, online. Uh, the others that we also, I also do recommend are things like uh, the New Law Journal uh, and also The Lawyer. I know with some of the content, I believe it's free, but I think some of it is also paid for. So you just have to check on those various websites to see what the, what the situation is. Of course, you can turn to, uh, to Google uh, and do a search on there. I'm sure you'll find a wide range of choices. Uh, my suggestion probably would be to look at about maybe five or six and then pick one that you enjoy reading and just take it from there. Because I find, you know, there are some styles of writing which people tend to prefer more than others. And of course, if you like a particular writing style or a particular writer's style, then perhaps it's probably better that you start reading that to begin with, just to get you moving in the right direction. Um, in, in, and as I say, at the end of the day, it's 10 minutes. It really doesn't have to be more than that, but it will build up over time. Of course, if you've got more time, then feel free to read even more. It's only going to help you in the long run. Um, for those of you maybe wanting a, a bigger challenge, uh, maybe those of you who read legal judgments, for example, as part of your, your, your work in your own language, you could try looking at uh, judgments in English. And a great website for that is the British uh, and Irish Legal Information Institute. It's uh, just there on the screen. It says www.bai. Lii.org. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good website that you can uh, you can turn to. Okay, so um, another skill that I obviously uh, touched upon earlier was listening. So in terms of developing listening skills in legal English, uh, there are some useful publications that you can use. Uh, the first one uh, is a booklet which I have used on several occasions with clients, uh, which has approximately twenty uh, listening exercises. They are aimed at intermediate level listeners. So if you think that maybe you're a lower level listener, then it could prove quite challenging, but maybe it's worth trying it to see if you can manage it. Or for example, if you've got limited legal vocabulary, again, you, find, you might find it more challenging, but even as an intermediate level learner, you still might find it challenging. Hopefully you will. Um, the listing exercises, they range from uh, like a lecturer giving a talk about an area of law, uh, for example, insolvency. Um, there is another exercise where you have a meeting between lawyer 
uh, and a client where you have to listen for specific information and then you have to answer the questions. And lastly, uh, that you listen to a meeting between a lawyer and a client and decide if the information written down is true or false. Uh, the actual booklet is called Listenings for Professional Legal English. And you can see there's the websites from the Tolls uh, website. Uh, so www.tollslegal.com uh, forward slash shop. OK, that's one uh, good publication. If you uh, don't have time to sit down and listen at home because you've got so many things going on, but for example, you commute to work, maybe by, by, by train or by car, not at the moment, maybe in view of the current situation, but maybe you have now had that situation relaxed, but you could obviously listen to a Legal English podcast. Um, now there are uh, actually uh, quite a few, well, not that many podcasts, but there are, there are a few good ones out there that you could potentially listen to. And the first one is courtesy of the BBC. Uh, they have a podcast called Law in Action, Law in Action, which you can listen to for free. And the podcasts are approximately 30 minutes long and they cover a wide range of legal issues from Brexit to abusive parents. So it's quite wide ranging. It's very interesting. Again, feel free to have a listen to it and see if it's uh, the type of thing that you, you know would be of interest to you and continue listening if it is. Uh, another one, if you're interested about case law, is an excellent uh, podcast by a gentleman called Marcus Cleaver, and it's called UK Law Weekly. That's UK Law Weekly, where in about 10 minutes, so the same length of time I was talking about reading articles, in about 10 minutes, he provides a concise and clear breakdown of recent UK case law. So again, it's another great way to develop your understanding and your listening. Uh, and one final one I can recommend is a podcast which is called Law Pod UK. Law Pod UK, and that's presented by barristers. So this is one of the uh, branches of the legal profession in the in the United Kingdom. We have solicitors and barristers. Uh, barristers uh, are sort of maybe considered more more expert in their field, in certain fields perhaps. Uh, and these are barristers who represent who who are in a, a chambers called One Crown Office Row. It's, it's a set of chambers in central London, uh, and their podcasts cover developments across all aspects of civil and public law in the UK. So that's another area that you can potentially, uh, hopefully get some, some valuable information from as well. Drafting, uh, drafting documents. Obviously, as we know, uh, drafting is probably one of the longest things that we have to do uh, in our legal careers. And uh, I'm sure you've probably had to uh, draft many documents uh, as a lawyer, if you, you are one. And if you're training at the moment, you probably also have to draft a lot of documents. And uh, it's something which obviously takes time to to improve. If you work in an international law firm, it's likely that you will already have templates templates, sorry, that you can amend according to the client's instructions. However, if your own legal if you have your own legal practice or you can only do occasional work in English, your English drafting skills may be more limited. If this applies to you or you're currently studying law and want to know some useful resources to help you with drafting. Uh, I've got a few that I can and offer as a, to consider looking at. Uh, the first one, uh, when it comes to contract drafting, is called uh, A Manual of Style for Contract Drafting by an author, Kenneth A. Adams. It's currently in its fourth edition, uh, which uh, is quite a, I think, I think it's about £92 or thereabouts uh, in price. I'm sure you can probably find it in places like Amazon. Uh, another publication is called Clarity for Lawyers, which is Effective Legal Language. Uh, this is actually a publication from the Law Society, which is the uh, body which uh, uh, rep basically represents um, solicitors here within the United Kingdom. And that's uh, by Mark Adler and Daphne Perry. There is also, if you're in, you know, if you need to obviously improve your uh, grammar, uh, you've got the Legal English Grammar Guide by Michael John Davies. That's the Legal English Grammar Guide. Uh, and one other book, which if you're interested in maybe gaining a legal qualification, a legal English qualification, which I'm going to touch on shortly is the Lawyer's English Language Coursebook, which is currently in its second edition, which again, you can also find at the tollslegal.com uh, forward slash uh, website as well. The same uh, website, which I mentioned earlier about the uh, professionals for uh, legal English uh, listing as well. Yes, so I was talking about the, uh, the legal English qualifications. Um, so for those of you either studying law in your own country or who are qualified lawyers looking to gain qualifications in legal English, there are currently two options available. If you want an internationally recognized qualification, uh, the only one that I'm currently aware of on offer is the test uh, of legal English skills, otherwise known as TOLS, T-O-L-E-S. 
And there are three levels for that. There's foundation, higher, and advanced. Uh, there are books available uh, to prepare for the course. And the London School of English uh, also offers a one-week course to help prepare for the exam, which I believe Sylvia is going to maybe touch upon a little bit later. Uh, previously, uh, Cambridge did offer a legal English course known as ILEC, A-I-L-E-C, uh, but this was discontinued from December 2016, so that's no longer available. Uh, the other option, of course, that is available is getting a, a legal English certificate from uh, an individual institution like the London School of English. Uh, which offer their own certificates. So, for example, the London School of English uh, offer a three-week intensive legal course, uh, which includes both civil and criminal vocabulary, uh, drafting contracts and, negoti and negotiations. Uh, and of course, at the end of the course, uh, you will receive a certificate from the London School of English confirming that you have completed the course. Uh, and this, again, I'm sure is something that uh, Sylvia can touch upon a little bit uh, later on as well. I mean, again, just out of interest, um, have you obtained a, a legal uh, English qualification yourself uh, already? Just out of interest, does anyone have any legal English qualifications? Uh, and if you do, uh, which one and from which institution? Just out of interest. And also, have you actually made use of it uh, within your within your career so far? Uh, and if so, how? I'd be interested to know. So do please drop in a chat. Uh, and It'd be nice to know uh, if you have and how so. Um, if you have a legal, legal English qualification, just some things maybe to consider if you haven't already put it to good use, or maybe you're thinking about getting a legal English qualification. Um, so if you do have one already, uh, make sure that you put it on your CV. It seems obvious, but sometimes people forget because it is important. It is a qualification at the end of the day. And also very importantly, if you haven't done so already, uh, put it on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, if you have one. Uh, and if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, then I would encourage you, encourage you to create one and put one down, you know, put it in within your details, as it's an excellent platform uh, to network with, obviously, other professionals, uh, both in the legal profession, as well as, as well as other professional professions and industries. Uh, also, another thing that you can do, either, you know, on LinkedIn as well, or aside from that, is to write articles. Uh, either on the area of law that you're you're either studying maybe at the moment or that you are currently practicing in and post it as well either if you have a, a blog uh, you can look at uh, legal blogs and maybe offer it to a, a legal you know, a legal blogger for example or you can set up your own legal blog this is another possibility but as i say if you've if you've got a linkedin profile you can even put it on there uh, and obviously get some engagement and, and get people to interact hopefully with you and again, as I say, this is a great way of, of gaining recognition uh, and also to raise your profile because um, you simply don't know who's going to read it uh, and obviously then respond to you, which would be a great thing. Uh, another thing you can do, of course, is to join uh, maybe legal forums where you can discuss different legal topics with other people. Uh, and again, this will be a great opportunity to develop, to develop your vocabulary and also give you an ability to argue your position. Um, you know, again, this is a great way to build confidence. And again, this is something that you can mention, you know, on your CV as well and, and in your LinkedIn profile that you are part of these forums uh, and that you are engaged. The, the point is, is that it shows that you are someone that likes to engage and that you are, you know, putting yourself out there and you're trying to, you know, improve your, your, your level, which is which, which obviously people will see. Uh, you can also follow certain legal organisations. So, for example, here in the UK, we have the Law Society. Uh, if you want to, um, uh, to the... Um, you know, for, for barristers, you have the Bar Association, for example. These are great places to follow as well. And again, you can get a lot of great content from there, which you can learn and you can read about. And also, it's a great way to to network as well. Uh, if you, you know, if, obviously, if you don't have your legal legal English qualification, and if you feel confident enough to do so, again, still write articles, put them out there. Again, if you have it on your LinkedIn profile, it will raise your profile. It will get recognition. Uh, and of course, bearing in mind that English isn't your first language. You know, people are not going to be that harsh on you, but it's a great opportunity for you to gain, uh, you know, get gain some further insights and get some feedback from other people. And again, a great way to build your network as well. OK. So um, I hope you found that uh, useful and you've got some valuable points from there. And uh, glad to see we've got uh, Olga and Sylvia back here to, to join us again. Um, yeah. 
Olga, I would you, uh, like to, uh, if there are, are there any comments or points? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Ziad, for, uh, for this very useful and practical advice on uh, improving legal English and mastering it. And also, it was great to see uh, participation from uh, from people from different countries, Brazil, uh, and uh, uh, and also from Poland, uh, from Luxembourg, and from many more uh, countries. So uh, Spain as well, uh, very good to see. Uh, we uh, have a uh, live chat, so please do write questions uh, as they come in uh, right now. And uh, meanwhile, uh, I just also to say that uh, we would need to be, um, we, we have about 10 minutes, I think, uh, just mindful in terms of the time for questions. But just to start with, um, the first question, uh, which uh, relates to uh, specifically legal English training, uh, Ziad, we have... Um, two uh, group courses in legal English, one for um, newly graduates, uh, newly graduated lawyers uh, between the ages of 20 to 30. And then we also have another one for experienced lawyers uh, uh, with the ages 30 plus. So uh, in, from, uh, in your experience, what do you see are the main challenges of uh, those two groups? Uh, do they differ and uh, what advice would you give to them? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, they, they're, they're obviously, yes, they are different because clearly the, 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 the way that the courses are structured, they're very much focused toward two different, uh, two, two, two different categories. So obviously in the first instance with the, with the 20 to 30 group range, uh, it's a great uh, you know, uh, foundation to be able to build from. So if you are in a situation, for, even if you're you know, an experienced legal professional in your own country, however, you've not really used legal English, it's a great uh, broad, you know, it gives you a great grounding in relation to the legal concepts, uh, the legal terminology that we use in legal English, uh, and it gives you a great all-round understanding. And it also touches, obviously, in a more in a general sense, on certain areas with a particular focus on civil law, uh, which does help. It does it does cover criminal law to a certain degree, but obviously it's more civil law focused, as we found with experience. Uh, predominantly, many of the the people that uh, do the course are, you know, do end up having a, a civil law background. Uh, so that's really helpful as to, to get a good grounding. Whereas with the professional course, it's obviously more focused towards the, those that have got several years worth of experience. So the focus is more on drafting, for example, uh, you know, written exercises, trying to draft contracts, negotiation in more depth, and also an opportunity to interact with legal professionals. So they have an opportunity to have somebody from a, a legal practice in the UK come in uh, and discuss with them about you know, a particular uh, area of law, whether it be corporate law or company law or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, thank you, Ziad. And uh, Sylvia, uh, I know that uh, you you deal quite a lot with questions related to those two courses. So uh, specifically for uh, Legal English uh, twenty thirty course, I can see that uh, we've got uh, lots of people joining us from from Brazil, from uh, from European countries uh, that uh, that actually are interested quite often in the legal English training. Can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, this course and also? Um, what exactly does it cover and uh, how how is that uh, different, for example, from face to face course to virtual group courses? Sure. Um, so clients who come to us for those courses are, as Ziad was actually kind of talking about in his presentation, um, uh, want to really work on developing a more accurate uh, uh, terminology. So they want to be able to transfer their skills from their first language into English and be able, as Ziad was saying, perhaps to access, you know, a more specific reading uh, to be able to uh, interact. And who knows? For the younger, for example, for the younger legal, uh, uh, our younger lawyer lawyers um, are more keen to perhaps start putting under their, their belt some experience in order to perhaps apply for um, international firms. So their ability to be able to kind of communicate in uh, uh, in legal terms and be accurate is is essential. So the. So that's one of the main thing. Uh, Ziad also mentioned the importance actually of the um, of the listening skills. So we do cover a lot of that as well in the course to again kind of burst their um, their confidence when it comes to that. Um, he also mentioned networking. So networking is an essential part of the of the course, both for the more mature um, uh, lawyers and the younger lawyers as well. 
So in both our courses, the face-to-face -face or the um, virtual, there is very little difference between the two. I mean, pedagogically, they're identical. So um, our clients will be able to interact with the trainer. Uh, they'll be looking at exactly the same material as if they were um, in London. Um, uh, also, in terms of networking, uh, there is the possibility of, uh, of networking within our platform, uh, the platform we use for the virtual classes. So uh, although, obviously, there is not the same interaction outside the teaching hours uh, as you would get for example in London but there is a plenty of space and time within the lesson to do so. Yeah thank you very much and it's very interesting to see that even though uh, people are not exactly physically located in the same place this networking is still going on so mm -hmm. this uh, this process of training uh, of uh, uh, improving their English and listening, uh, listening to people from different uh, countries uh, with different accents uh, and also building and strengthening their uh, professional connections. Uh, this is a very important part of the course as well. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, another question, um, Ziad, um, which uh, I, I know we uh, talked about, um, so we quite often have uh, people who say, uh, actually, uh, it's I, uh, I'm a little bit confused in terms of when uh, to use which expression, uh, say, for example, shall uh, versus will in legal English or yes. some examples. Uh, what would you, uh, of course, it's it's a lot about just getting to grips with uh, the legal English vocabulary, but uh, what would you recommend them uh, to do in this particular circumstance? Yeah, of course. Well, on this issue of the word shall and will, you're absolutely right. It can be uh, it's sort of See, it can be a little bit confusing. I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, when we talk about the word shall, shall if it effectively implies that, you know, you have a duty to do something uh, or, you know, you're required to do something. And you'll see this an awful lot, obviously, in, in contracts, for example, like uh, if we talk about property as it's my area. So, for example, um, you know, the tenant shall, not the, ten not the tenant will, but the tenant shall provide, you know, 21 days notice to the landlord in order to vacate premises, for example. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, this kind of terminology is something which only really, you know, as a lawyer or, or someone who is learning law, they will begin to understand the differences between when they would use shall, as in it's, you know, it's a requirement, and will, which is almost, you know, it's compulsory. You know, you have to do this. Uh, you know, there is no other, there is no other alternative. But we, you know, we sort of you know, differentiate this, but it is actually covered in a lot more depth uh, you know on uh, you know on the courses as well they do took they do, they do tackle these uh, particular issues of terminology mm -hmm. yeah and uh, uh, and uh, also there are lots of practical exercises as well as i know case studies uh, etc so that we can uh, interact and, uh, all the areas that i mentioned so there are opportunities to have listening exercises which are also very very helpful again looking out for, for various within the case studies themselves whether they be relating to you know civil matters uh, or mm -hmm. criminal but with, I say, with a particular focus on civil law matters, yes. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think uh, we need to wrap up this sec uh, this particular session, uh, and it was a pleasure to uh, to learn so much more about the legal English uh, from Ziad and also Sylvia uh, with your advice uh, on uh, uh, legal English courses at the London School of English. And uh, just to say that uh, we've got uh, we've got uh, quite a few legal English courses coming up. So, for example, do check. Um, uh, information on Legal English 2030 course, uh, which we're running um, on this particular link, uh, which is shown on the um, uh, on the screen. And uh, if you have any questions about this particular course, you can always get in touch with us uh, via our email on clients at londonschool.com and it would probably be Sylvia who will be uh, who will be helping you with all, all, all of those questions. So yeah, Andrea, I can see Andrea has just written to us about uh, inquiring one of the courses. So Andrea, please do write to us at that email address and I'll be happy to give you more mm -hmm. information about the course. Yeah, definitely. Um, also, um, just to say uh, that we do have uh, new, uh, uh, we have several upcoming um, live streams uh, similar to this one, um, which uh, will be available for you uh, this Thursday. Uh, this is uh, going to be on uh, the subject of presenting in English. A very useful subject, I guess, for a lot of uh, lawyers as well. 
uh, as I'm sure uh, you need to present in front of their clients and in front of your, uh, of your colleagues. So uh, you can find more information over here on the screen. Uh, and uh, we have uh, another uh, very uh, useful live stream uh, on uh, Tuesday next week on 16th of June, preparing for your job interview in English uh, with frequently asked questions and, uh, and uh, answers, including uh, how to uh, express yourself um, in the most effective way uh, during job interviews in English. So do uh, sign up to those live streams and to our YouTube channel. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that would be it for today. But uh, Ziad, Silvia, if you've got uh, a, a, few, uh, a few words to say uh, in, to, our, uh, to our viewers and participants, uh, then please do. Go ahead, Silvia. <laughs> well, I, I hope all of you will actually write to me at the uh, email address that um, Olga just showed. So if you have any any uh, questions about our courses or if you need any more tips, even regarding this uh, um, presentation, do get back to us. Very happy to help. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking the time to watch us today. Uh, I hope you found, as I say, some of the points useful and please do put them into, you know, into practice and uh, never fear. You know, there is a, always an opportunity to learn and to develop uh, and just keep on going and moving forward. Uh, and I'm sure you'll do very well. Thank you very much for your time. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you for uh, to everyone who's joined uh, for this uh, live stream. We hope we, you have a wonderful day, uh, evening, night, uh, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, keep safe uh, keep, uh, and keep learning English. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Um,